and we're going to be moving over to we're going to back up just a little bit to pages uh, 264. And we're going to talk about a couple instances here that you guys need to know about, especially when you start going and start working with capacitor banks out there in the field. Okay, Radcliffe. So uh, what we're looking at here is uh, figure 10-12, 10-13, and 10-14 is instances in a, in a circuit when you're going to be working on utility circuits out there. And it's, it's more of the terminology that's going to be used when you're out there in the field working. If you'll notice, and this is an indu inductive circuit, so I have more inductive load on the circuit then I do capacitive load. And you remember before when we showed a pure inductive circuit and we showed a pure capacitive circuit and a pure resistive circuit, those were completely 180 degrees out of phase with each other. The figure that you see in 10-12 is more of a circuit instance that you'll see as far as the waveform is concerned day by day because there is resistance in a circuit and there is capacitance in a circuit, and there's inductance in a circuit, say the entire feeder line, that kind of tries to balance it, out, balance it out. So the instance we have here is the indu induced voltage is greater than the circuit current. All right, for terminology purposes, and what they say out there is your dispatchers and engineers, is the current is lagging the induced voltage, or the current is lagging the voltage. Now, why do I say lagging? It delays it. It's behind it. See how it's behind it in the line? In the waveform of figure 10-12? Circuit current is lagging. It's behind the induced voltage or the circuit voltage of the circuit. In that diagram that I have right there, that is current is lagging. So current is lagging behind the induced voltage. If you look at the figure in 10-13, it's the same thing. It's just at a larger size. Current is behind induced voltage, it's behind it. Look at the uh, figure in 10-14. Now my applied voltage is behind and my circuit is ahead. So my, now my applied voltage is lagging. The first one, 10, 12, current is lagging. Now my voltage is lagging in figure 10-14. You can also, and people do this in utilities when they talk about this, is you can use either the leading or the lagging terminology. So I'll stay with 14. In that figure right there, voltage is lagging and current is leading. Does everybody understand that? You see the applied voltage line, waveform is lagging and the current is leading in that one. Figure 10 12, the current is lagging and the voltage is leading. <coughs> I just want you guys to know those terms out there because people, dispatchers, especially when you're working with capacitor banks, they're going to give you information. Well, at this time, uh, the current circuit current is lagging the voltage. And they do have what they call a power factor number. As soon as you close the capacitor back in, now you're, you should go to a figure 10-14. That's gonna change once you in, include capacitance to the system through a capacitor bank on a distribution system, the applied voltage is gonna lead the current flow. And they can see that in the dispatch center. So they know and understand, that's how they know and understand that when you've closed or opened a capacitor bank out there in the field, you'll notice also, is there both 1012 and 1014, is it ever 100% resistive? Remember what a resistive circuit looks like? 
in phase. Yeah, it's in phase. Both the current line and the circuit line are, are right together. Is any circuit out there in the world going to be like that all the time? Only a pure one, right? Sir? You can say, like, isn't a pure? Yeah. Pure circuit always going to be that 100% of the time? Yeah, say I have a distribution uh, feeder coming out of a substation and that feeder feeds down Highway 501 and I've got businesses to it, I've got homes attached to it. As far as the power factor, you know, the waveform of both the current and voltage of my circuit, is it ever pure resistive overall? No. No, it, no. it, it never will be. Guys, these, these uh, waveforms going like this of current and voltage are just moving back and forth like this all the time. Now, if induced, uh, induced voltage gets way out of whack, then we include a capacitor back to bring it back more into line to be hopefully get it close to resistive, but it never is 100% resistive. You wanna try to keep those two waveforms of applied voltage and current flow as close together as you can, but it never really matches all the time. It's constantly changing. And remember, as we bounce back to the resistive circuit, that is the most optimum we can have in a utility. When we're close to the resistive circuit waveform, we're being the most effective we can in producing voltage and having current on our lives to feed customers. Okay, just wanted to go over that real quick. Now in unit 11, we've already been over capacitors and what capacitors do. Inductive loads, are purely what they say. They're transformers, they make no contact. I've got to in induce voltage from one coil to another. Capacitors are electrostatic loads. So they're going on the voltage value and they induce voltage into the line how many times per second? 60. 60 times per second. Great, fantastic. Okay. Huh? What page you in? I was just going through capacitive loads real quick. Oh, okay. That was just a synopsis of it right there. Now the rest of that chapter really gets into variable capacitors and it gets into uh, capacitor types and values. But, excuse me. We'll talk more about those later. Okay. So what we had caught up to, and we were uh, give you just a short one is the three-phase circuits. We had gotten up to page 300 and we talked about three-phase circuits and we actually had a quiz on it. Uh, so that should be all square right there and we'll talk more about three-phase circuits as we go along. What are the two different types of connections in three-phase? Y and delta. Y and delta connections. Y and delta connections. Uh, does a Y have a grounded neutral? Yes, sir. Does a delta? No, sir. It does not. Okay, fantastic. Appreciate you doing all the hard work for us, Paul. Mm -hmm. I'm just reading my notes, that's all. And that's because you take notes. <laughs> okay, I'm up to page 315, and I'll read this out to you. All right, an important concept, and this is really not a concept, an important fact, when dealing with polyphase power, and they're talking three-phase power, is phase rotation. Phase rotation can be a major concern in, some, concern in some situations. For example, assume that the three-phase transformer supplying power to an industrial location has to be replaced. If the phase rotation of the new connection is not the same as the old, all of the motors in the plant will operate in reverse when power is restored. Phase rotation can be best illustrated with the stator winding of a three-phase motor. When power is applied to the stator, a magnetic field will rotate around the inside of the stator winding, figure 12-20. Uh, Three factors that cause the field to rotate are the following. One, the fact that the three-phase voltages are 120 degrees out of phase with each other. One rotation is 360 degrees. We have three phases. 
360 divided by three is 120. The place of the windings around the stator core, or the motor core, the fact that the voltages reverse polarity at regular intervals. The direction of phase rotation can be reversed by changing the connection of any two of the three phase power lines. A phase rotation meter, figure 12-21, can be used to determine the phase rotation of a motor before it is applied to the circuit. All right. So what are we, what are we talking about when they talk uh, two different phases? What do I need to do as far as my connections are concerned? I'll bring up a paint screen here to help you guys out. Like you got brown, orange, yellow, brown, orange, yellow. You got to make sure they're hooked up in the right order. Right, right. So if my circuitry is going, and we talked about this before, brown, orange, yellow is on the electrician side. So we know what the electrician's conductor is. What uh, colors do we use on a distribution uh, utility side? What is the color coding? Red, Red white, white, and blue. blue. Red, Red, white, and blue. blue. So if I match my A to boy or B, brown, so it's red to brown, and if I go, let's see, white is B for me and orange for you, if those match, and C is uh, blue for me and yellow for you, if those match, then my phase rotation should be clockwise, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that should be fine. Now, for some reason, because in the wiring process of either utility or the company that has the uh, wiring that's going into their complex, if the phase <clears throat> rotation is wrong, what can I do to remedy it? Swap two of your leads. Yeah. Swap, well, and I, I kind of like to put it the other way, swap any one with another. So I could swap A with B, put B in the A position, A in the B position, I could swap A with C, put A in the uh, C position and C in the A position, and swap or swap B with C. Swap B and C. Any one of those swaps can be done, and then I can then get the correct phase rotation. Now, I like the way they kind of stated in the book. <laughs> as far as you're concerned, when you do a new install of a three-phase transformer, or a three-phase transformer bank, it is a good idea to go ahead and get the phase rotation and note it somewhere, you, typically on the meter base. You can draw on the inside of the meter base, and it's a real simple thing that you're gonna do here. Hold on. Power companies supply them and, oh, I didn't do it again, did that be? Lost it. Again? I just clean this place up too. I can do it with my mouse real quick. All right. Let's get that over there. And let's make this huge. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, usually we, we either used a permanent black magic marker on the inside of the meter base or the meter cover where the wires came in, or we used one of those paint pens. Is what you'll do is go inside the uh, meter base and you will make a marking of like this. What does that designate? Clockwise rotation. Clockwise rotation. Okay, that's the measurement that you took with your rotation meter and we'll go over with a rotation meter here in just a moment. And I typically like to also include below that A, B, and C. Okay, so it lets the next person know, hey, this guy hooked this up, A, B, C, red, white, blue, 
and his reading that he got out of his rotation meter was clockwise. It also helps if the guy, if the electrician comes along and they're doing an install after you are, it also lets them know how the wiring diagram is gonna be going as far as rotation is concerned so he can match what you're doing as far as the feed in from the utility. Okay, there are plenty of rotation meters. So this, this is gonna be a new one coming to you here. We've had a volt meter, we've had the phasing sticks meter, we've had the uh, amp meter, a rotation meter, and I like to use these styles. I don't like to use the electronic ones. So share screen, screen one, share. Today, there you go. Phase rotation meter. You could tell I've searched for it before. Images. Plenty of them out there in the world. Uh, most of them uh, nowadays are electronic. And what you'll do is, uh, of course, I don't like, what's wrong with that one? You have three hands. <laughs> well, not only that, the color coding is wrong. Red, yellow, green, that's over in Japan or China. Okay. Get one that, that get one that conforms with your company, red, white, and blue. Now these are all digital lighted ones, and uh, I mean they'll work okay. They're uh, they're all right, but let me see if I can find. There you go. This is the one I think is most popular with utilities out there in the world. It's kind of old, old timey, but as far as the re reliability of it and the lifetime of it, it's one hundred percent. All right, what's your color coding? How are you gonna hook this up left to right, either in a, on a transformer or in a meter base? What's your color coding? Red to A, white to B, and blue to C. Thank you very much. All right, then all you'll have to do is take, and these guys have clamps on them, so it clamps on to whatever, you can have a free hand going on here. Then all you have to do is press the white button and you see the black dot that's inside here, it'll start turning. And if it starts turning clockwise, guess what? Good. You got clockwise rotation. If you're hooked up red, white, blue, and it starts turning clockwise, if it's a new installation, that's okay. On a new installation, the electrician has to match. Now, uh, Professor V, did you have a different policy in your company that you always had to be going clockwise no we didn't um we pretty much left it up to the um electrician we'd bring it in tap up his stuff and then we energize that he had to fix rotation on his end okay so and please gentlemen understand this is on a new install when we're talking in these instances right here yeah so guess what's inside this three phase Rotation meter. What do you think's inside of it? A coil. Well, Paul, you're almost there. Um, small motor. There you go. Yeah. If you're going to be checking rotation for three phase motors, there's just a small, very small three phase motor inside of here. That's why I think people really like it the best. You're actually testing on something that you're going to be applying power to. Uh, some of the digital ones that I've seen before or the ones that light up, you'll get, I would say, funky lighting. One will be dim and one will be bright. And it's, it's I don't know, Professor V, have you had the experience with the... Uh, uh, that's the only kind of meter we ever used is what you're showing there, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is the bread and butter yeah. of, of three-phase rotation meters. Now, take care of it. It's in a nice little case. It costs right around $400. So, so don't lose it. You said the case is $400? No, everything together. The one I just bought for the class is, is $380. Bucks. Everything I see on it, they're like 1000 bucks now. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I got this one from Mark Jones, so maybe it could be a deal. Yeah. All right. So things to check out for here, make sure that you're hooked up. And it's actually got on here, A, B, C, one, two, three. And that's left to right, red, white, blue. Press the button, the motor's gonna turn, and it'll show you the direction. 
Now we had talked about, we had done this on the initial install. So we're putting in something brand new to feed a, uh, feed like camp for or something like that. Some big place that's gonna have rotation. If we have a transformer failure, what we're gonna have to do, and this is why I like doing the markings, gentlemen, we're gonna have to replace that transformer, then rewire it back to the transformer and match the transformer now to what was existing before. That's why we have a marking in a meter base on the initial install. If I put it in brand new and I mark it clockwise, ABC, if something fails in the future or I need to change that transformer out for any reason, I need to now match whatever was there in the beginning. So it's imperative, it's pretty much imperative all the time that if you do a new install of a three phase installation, mark the phasing letters and the rotation direction. If you don't do this and you go to replace a transformer and you're really, how many chances do you have? Hmm. You've got one, you got three phases, you got a 33% chance that you're gonna get it right. And if you don't get it right in the phase rotation and you energize into a facility that's got three phase motors and you turn those motors backwards, you're pretty much gonna burn up every piece of equipment that's inside that plant. Uh, that's not a good day. So that shows you the importance of that. All right, let's uh, take a break here for about 10 and we'll come back at 9.55. Usually we can we run a lot of our motors backwards in case something is jammed up or something. We have to reverse it, try and get it unstuck. Electrically or manually? Electrically, we go in the disconnect and swap the leads. Okay. All right. Now, in other situations, yeah, it'd probably be a bad idea, but. <laughs> okay. All right, let's take a break. Okay, we'll get started back here. It's 9.55. So just to touch base here real quick on the uh, bottom or about mid of page uh, 316, that big old elaborate phase rotation meter that you see right there in that box, that is really not what's used out there in the world by alignment. The one photograph that I had showed you of the uh, phase rotation meter, there was actually the little three-phase motor inside the... Uh, round container right there, that, that's the one that you're gonna be using out there in the field. All right, moving on to unit 13 and transformers. So first paragraph, transformers are one of the most common devices found in the electrical field. They range in size from less than one cubic inch to requiring rail, rail cars to move them after they have been broken into sections. Their ratings can re range from MVA to GVA. So we have been talking a lot about and in distribution. What have we been talking about mostly? KVA. KVA, all right. Just to let you know, and that's why we went through this on math. You're gonna be at the distribution level. You're gonna be mostly at the KVA level. So that's kilovolt amperes, KVA. Uh, if you go into a substation, a substation transformer, the ones that, like the ones that you used in your uh, presentations there, are on the MVA range. So that's megavolt amperes. Uh, GVA transformers, I have not. Professor B, have you ever seen a GVA? Negative. I would suppose that you're going to maybe see some of those maybe as step-up transformers at a generating station but mostly uh, over in uh, other countries like China and India that have uh, real huge populations where you need to have gigavolt ampere transformation. It is imperative that anyone working in the electrical field have the understanding of transformer types and connections. This unit will present two main types of voltage transformers, isolation transformers and auto transformers. We'll talk about those in just a moment. Page 320. A transformer is a magnetically operated machine. Now, I like the way they put that right there. 
that can change values of voltage, current, and impedance without a change of frequency. Transformers are the most efficient machines ever known. Their effective, their efficiencies commonly range from 90 to 99% at full load. Transformers can be divided into several classifications. Well, as far as a transformer is concerned, why do they call it a machine? Machine, I think of gears and cogs and belts and all that kind of stuff. Why do they call it a machine? Instead of gears and stuff, it's got coals and stuff in it. Yeah, right. In it. All right. The other part of that is I, I usually produces think of something. <coughs> it, it produces something. I either take a voltage and I can input it and step up the voltage. So it's producing something out of that. Or I can either take a voltage and step it down. I can go either direction with that. Also, when I think of a machine, I also think of some type of movement. Right? So where is my movement? inside a transformer is there any movement involved in the coils the coils inside the transformers are moving then, no not the coils themselves like the magnetic field the magnetic field right right paul and uh i think that was briggs paul there is movement going on but it's not physical movement it's electric movement and what's that electric movement rela related to how am i getting movement inside a transformer the magnetic field. How is that moving? Current. How is that moving? Vibrations. Nope, no vibrations going on. No physical movement is happening. I'm relating all the way back to a couple of weeks ago. What is the sine wave of AC doing? Moving back and forth. There you go. There, there you go. It's moving back and forth. It's going to its peak. And it's go top peak and it's going down to its bottom peak. So that magnetic field is moving back and forth due to the sine wave. And that sine wave is actually coming right from generation. All right. This is going to be a future test question for sure. Three types of transformers. Number one, an isolation transformer. Number two, an auto transformer. And number three, a current transformer. Now, I'm pretty sure because this is the first time we brought this up, does anybody know what an isolation transformer is? Okay. Nope. Okay. That's good. That's fine. That's fine and dandy. I wouldn't expect that of that. We've really been working with isolation transformers all the time. All right. These transformers that I'm showing you that are pull mount transformers, I've got, I don't even know the size. This one looks pretty big, 75 or 100 kVA. And these 350 kVAs, these are isolation transformers. All right, the reason why they call them isolation is because my primary winding and my secondary winding are not making any contact. They're working through magnetic induction. Primary windings of this one, are creating a magnetic field that are captured by the secondary windings. And we talked about winding ratio before. If I have the correct winding ratio and the amount of windings, I'm able to transform voltage from, let's say 7,200 down to 240. The reason why they call it isolation is because there is no physical contact between my primary and secondary windings. <coughs> Second one. Auto transformer. We've discussed these before. What what's the picture that I have up on my screen? Voltage regulators. Those are voltage regulators. Now, as far as transformation is concerned, they are transforming voltages. But what's the first word that I'm using in there when I call it? It's number two. What I, what am I calling it? An auto transformer. So what's it doing? Making sure the voltage stays in the proper range. Right, automatically. It's doing it automatically. So that's why they call it an auto transformer. It's raising and lowering voltages without any kind of intervention 
from me. I don't have to stand there and do it. It's automatically doing that. You'll notice here, and think of this concept. It's kind of hard to understand, and it took me years to understand it too. Where are these voltage regulators placed? Where are they at? The substation. They're at the substation. Now, you can see the size of these things. That's about, what would you say, Professor V, the regulator itself, about eight, 10 feet high? Right. Right. And uh, you can actually see the KVA rating right here on the side of it is 334 KVA for each one of these voltage regulators. Now, as far as my distribution circuit is concerned, this is leaving the substation and going out now into a feeder line. Do you think there's more than 334 KVA on my feeder line attached to it? Yeah. Yeah, there's going to be tens of thousands in some situations. And that all of that transformation that's happening out of my system, how am I, why? What's the reason behind why this can be so small, but out of my system, I'm going to have to have transformers that are, you know, 10, 12 times the size of this. Think of how much voltage I need to transform. What was the question again? How much voltage in these regulators do I need to transform? Let's go ahead and do a little math here. I've got three phases. This is phase A, this is phase B, and this is phase C. 7,200 volts in, it's gonna be regulated at 7,200 volts out, optimally. If I need to stay within the plus or five percent, plus or minus five percent range, what is my winding ratio? Kind of a tough question, isn't it? Let's give it all around the scope of it, of it right here. When I have a 7,200 volt transformer, let's go back to this one right here and I need to go from 7,200 volts down to 240. Does everybody remember what the ratio is? One to 30. One to 30, right? And when I go one to 30, my amperage is gonna be going increasing also in that process. So the amount of transfer I need to have is relatively big. I'm going from a you know, if I have one amp at the top, I'm now gonna have 30 amps at the bottom, 10 at the amps at the top, 300 at the bottom. On a voltage regulator, how much do I need to transform? Plus or minus what? 5%. Yeah, and that's the way the windings are gonna be also. I either need to have a plus or minus 5% of my windings, so that's a relatively small size of windings I'm going to need to do in either reduction of voltage or the increase in voltage. That's why these are smaller than a normal transformer. I don't need to transform or change my voltage that much, only by plus or minus 5%. All right, so an auto transformer, and that's just the, another name for it, an auto transformer, another name for it is voltage regulator, especially when it comes to utility system. All right, and third one, current transformer. We've talked about this one before. What does it do? Take it from the words. Transforms current. Transforms current. That's, that's what it, exactly what it does. It takes a high current value and transforms that current value down to a lower value so you're able to meter and measure it. Okay. A basic law concerning transformers is that all values of a transformer are proportional to its turns ratio. We've discussed this in math multiple times. This does not mean that the exact number of turns of wire on each winding must be known to determine the different values of voltage and current for a transformer. What must be known is the ratio of turns. 
<clears throat> for example, assume a transformer has two windings. One winding is the primary, has 1,000 turns of, turns of wire, and the other, the secondary, has 250 turns of wire. What's the ratio? One to four. One to four or four to one, whatever direction that you're headed. Right? The turns four ratio of this transformer is four to one, or four to one, as you see. This indicates there are four turns of wire on the primary for every one turn of wire on the secondary side. And they'll give you an example down there at the bottom, figure 13-1. So if we apply a voltage to this, let's take the primary side of 7,200. That pen's not working. There you go. If we apply 7,200 volts, in this image that we have for 13-1, and our ratio is four to one, what's the voltage gonna be on my secondary 250 turn side? 1800. 1800. Four divided by 1700 equals 1800 volts. There you go. All right, they go into more detail here. Pick, uh, figure, 13-2 at the bottom of page 321. Isolation transformers. The isolation transformer, this means that the secondary winding is physically and electrically isolated from the primary winding. There is no electrical connection between the primary and secondary winding. And you'll notice in this diagram, they have now included, and they have the diagram of 13-1, see those two straight lines between the windings? that will let you know that there is a no contact. It is completely isolated from one another. Now, how am I getting voltage from the primary to secondary winding there? What, what is being produced to be able to get voltage over there? Movement. Movement and? Magnetic field. Magnetic field, there you go. Moving a magnetic field, and then the other part of that component is the secondary winding. There's my other conductor. Now I have all three components to make voltage on the other side. Fantastic, Paul, thank you very much. <clears throat> all right. Page 323. Figure 13-5, the isolation transformer greatly reduces uh, voltage spikes, which it, it does in situations, and usually you don't have voltage spikes unless it originates all the way from generation. Now, does frequency also go across from the primary to secondary windings? If I have a 60 hertz frequency on the primary, will I also have a 60 hertz frequency on the secondary? You should. You should, because that movement on the primary side is going right along with the magnetic field that's being induced on the secondary side. So, 60, so 60 I got a question. Yes, sir. Like if we took our like phone chargers and stuff to like Europe or somewhere where they don't use 60 hertz, you'd have to get some kind of adapter or something? Correct. Most of your European countries are, are doing two different things right here. One is they don't supply 120. Everything is 240. Two is they're at 50 hertz frequency. So that is why you do have to have an adapter of some type to plug in anything that you're coming from the United States with, uh, laptops, everything like that, that's uh, supposed to run on 60 hertz, will need to have a converter because they're, uh, Professor V, I, I don't know if you've been over, I have never seen, I've been to Germany, uh, China multiple times. Uh, all I've ever seen is 240. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have any kind of 120. They always supply 240 for everything. Plus, everything's at 50 hertz. Okay. Okay. Now, the figure 13-6, right in the middle of that page of 323, you'll notice now figure 13-5, that's really just an air type coil that we're looking at, and that's the electrical schematic for one. If you look at 13 6, what have they now introduced? An iron core. They've in, in, introduced an iron core. Now, remember from the past, we had spoke about that the windings 
are insulated from themselves, even though they're they're visible, you, you can still see kind of like the copper inside of them. The winding itself is insulated from each one of the windings that's on the core, and there's insulation between the winding and the core. Okay, like I said before, you cannot make any kind of phys physical contact there. So when I introduce an iron core, what does it do for my magnetic field? It, uh, does it increase its potential? You got two different things. One is increase. My magnetic, magnetic field will now be increased. And what's the other? Anybody got any ideas? I'm gonna have to find my pen here pretty soon. All right, if you look at the magnetic core, and if you were to take your pen or pencil and just draw a circle around that magnetic core, staying within the core area, it's now focused. Okay, the intensity is greater, and now that magnetic field is actually gonna travel the path of the magnetic core itself. It's just not gonna be free out in space. Yet an air, core, air coil, it would just be going and flying out everywhere, typically out of both ends, the top and the bottom part of the coil, but it'd be just headed out like you see in a magnetic field when you see a magnet on a piece of paper with the iron filings, it'd just be flying out. With an iron core, it is now focused. And that iron core is gonna focus that magnetic field back and forth down to the secondary winding. So that's why they use cores and transformers. It helps you reduce the amount of windings that you need, and it's much more efficient in focusing the magnetic field from the primary winding to the secondary winding. Uh, figure 13 dash, uh, seven, once again, gives you a good idea of, of how that is working. All right, the back and forth motion of AC. And then 13-8 is also doing that in that concept of going on to uh, following the magnetic core. All right, we're not gonna get into excitation currents or yet uh, or mutual induction. That comes along when we start talking about generation. We get into generation deeper. So I'm gonna move on. Uh, the rest of the chapter really gets into uh, electronics transformers. All right, and then we're gonna go to what we talked about a good bit before. We're we holding as far as time here, 10, 15, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm on uh, page 337, distribution transformers. A very common type of dis dis isolation transformer is the distribution transformer. This transformer changed the high voltage of a power company's distribution lines to the common 240-120 voltage used to supply power to most homes and to many businesses. In this example, it is assumed that the primary is connected to a 7,200 volt line. The secondary is a 240 volt with a center tap. The center tap is grounded and becomes the neutral conductor. All right, we've talked about this a little while ago. If we now in introduce a neutral conductor, is it delta or Y? Y. Y, there you go, fantastic. If voltage is measured across the entire secondary, a voltage of 240 volts will be seen. If the voltage is measured from either line to the center tap, half of the secondary voltages of 120 volts will be seen. The reason for this is that the voltages between the two secondary lines are in phase with each other. If a vector diagram is drawn to illustrate this condition, it will be seen that the grounded neutral conductor is connected to the axis point of the two voltage vectors. Easier to explain right here, figure 13-9. <coughs> You'll see at the top there, 7,200 volts AC. Then you'll see your center tap, one coil, the other coil, which measure 120 volts phased to neutral, and your neutral is grounded by the symbol right there, and the combination of the two coils is 240 volts. 
Now we had talked about this a little bit before and to see if we remember how well you did on, on the quiz. How am I able to get 240 volts out of this transformer, period? On the top side, they're all doing one direction. And then on the bottom, you got two opposing directions. Right, right. Either they're going, either they're facing inward or they're facing outward. So they're able to catch the sine wave both at the peak and at high peak and both at the low peak to be able to produce 240 volts. That's how 240 volts are attained out of the transformer. Opposing secondary direction windings. And after class, I got a question about that on the test. What Unless you want to answer it now. I'll answer it now. Because on the test, it said that one was waiting for you to grade it. And I don't know if you ever gave the points for it or. I, that, that was a written, written reply, right? Yeah, and it said it had to wait for you to grade it. Th that's totally correct. Okay, I was making sure. Okay. Good deal. I didn't know if you got to it or not. Uh, has it been graded yet? I still have the same grade as I did before. Has it been graded yet? Mm -hmm. uh, I guess not then. It has not. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, auto transformers, figure 13-24. Auto transformers are, what do we call them in our substations? Regulators. Voltage regulator. Voltage regulators, okay. An auto transformer just changes, and you'll see at the bottom of figure 13-24, uh, all it's doing as far as an auto transformer is concerned is changing the winding ratio automatically. Now, it's a pretty elaborate piece of equipment because I don't want to change one connection to another connection. Every time that I did that, as far as a voltage regulator was concerned, and if I did that incorrectly, every time I needed to step up the voltage or lower the voltage, your power would be going off. Makes sense? I'm changing from one winding to another winding. So it's actually going to be making physical contact between B and C, C and D, all the time until it makes a full rotation as far as the contact is concerned. You'll notice in the diagram, there's a load line right there. If you come up and go to the left, there's an arrow pointed to D, C, B, and A. Contact is maintained on D only right now, if it needs to lower the voltage, it will take and go over to C, maintaining contact with the two until it's fully seated in C. Here's what I found on the web. Wow, my phone's actually finding it for me. How about that? Google is listening to you all the time, just to let you know that. Okay. So that's the way an auto transformer work. It is just rotating between the settings of your uh, transformer or the amount of windings that you have in your regulator to include windings or exclude windings to be able to raise and lower your voltage. All right. Guess what comes up next, Professor V? Mm -mm. What is it? Three phase transformers. Hello. Okay. That's where you're going to kick in with your fantastic drawings, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think for today, and I'm going to leave it open a little bit because I got some guys who want to ask some questions here and whatnot about information. Uh, I think for today, that'll pretty much cover what we need to cover for today until we get into three phase that actually starting to push into 112, correct, Professor B? Yes. Okay. So, stop share there. Uh, anything that you wish to include, Professor V? Uh, for today, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah, when we... When we get out on the field today, um, I don't think it's raining, is it? No, we're good here. 
Um, bring bring you something to write with. Um, got a piece of paper for you to fill out today. Your um, graduation applications. Oh, uh, thank you for reminding me. Yep. Yep, graduation application. It is imperative <laughs> that you fill that thing out. Yep. Uh, if you don't fill out a graduation application and submit it, you won't graduate. And it's kind of a weird thing. Yeah, it's kind of a weird thing. Okay. So unless you have further questions, we will be meeting out at the field at 1230 today. Uh, I will hang around for another uh, 30 minutes or so to answer questions. And I will probably go ahead and grade those quizzes for that one question that was missing. Any, any, any other questions before you leave? Yes, sir. Okay. When are we, uh, you said we were presenting those projects? No. Oh, uh, okay. Never mind. Anybody else? Oh, Mr. Sherman. Yeah, I just want to make sure you got my uh, generation to meet a project <laughs> because I was having uh, trouble. Stand by. I'll double check for you. Okay. Thank you.